We will always make those uh, questions and answers available after the webinar, and that will be linked to our webinars page when the webinar is archived. Um, there's also a link, a compressed link to the materials on our FTP site, and that's where I'll put the Q&A document, and a copy of the recording will also be there as well. So what we're going to talk about today is our targeted loci project. In particular, we'll talk about uh, the RefSeq ribosomal RNA sequences. And we're going to talk about these topics briefly with slides, and then I'll switch over to the web browser, and we'll do a couple of examples and demonstrate some things with these. We'll talk a little bit about what I'm talking about, what are targeted loci anyway. And one kind of targeted locus is, of course, a ribosomal RNA gene. Those are the ones I'm going to be talking about today. And I'll review a little bit about the structure of those. And then I'll talk about our NCBI RefSeq ribosomal RNA gene projects, two of them in particular, the 16S bacterial and archaeal project, and the fungal uh, ITS internal transcribed spacer region project. And then we'll look at how you can get to the data and retrieve them, download them, and search them, and things like that. So a targeted locus are, is some kind of a marker sequence, uh, a barcode sequence. Um, MIDA, in our service desk, like to call these measuring tape sequences. Um, these are used typically for phylogenetic studies or simply to identify the particular taxon or organism that you're working with. Simple examples are things that most people are familiar with, cytochrome oxidase barcode sequences. Um, there are various protein coding genes that are routinely used for phylogenetic analysis, and they have different degrees of conservation, so they're used for different phylogenetic distances. Uh, mitochondrial D-loop sequences. And then, of course, the main topic for today are the structural RNA genes. Um, these are organized into um, operon, operons in prokaryotes and these transcriptional units in eukaryotes. There is a 16S, a 23S, and a 5S gene in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, there is an 18S, a 5.8S, and a 28 or 25S, depending if you're talking about plants or animals, organized into a transcriptional unit. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on the ITS1 and ITS2 sequences for uh, eukaryotes when we're talking about the RNA genes. So let's quickly look at those, uh, and I've got some screenshots from um, our graphical sequence viewer just to sort of illustrate that. Um, this is a, a view of uh, Escherichia coli 0157H7, the genome of this, and this shows you one of the RNA, our ribosomal RNA operons. There's the 16S sequence, the 23S, and the 5S sequence. The 16S sequence, um, as many of you I'm sure know, is widely used in bacterial taxonomy and identification. And so there I've got alignment there showing you the 16S um, RefSeq RNA aligned to that 16S sequence in E. coli. In E. coli, there are seven copies of this operon. The 16S genes in this particular species of bacterium are similar enough that we make one of those for RefSeq. We'll come back to that in a moment. Here is a eukaryote, um, the structural RNA genes, uh, the transcriptional unit for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And you can see this uh, sort of highly annotated region. Um, you have the 25S, which we'll start at the other end, um, where you have uh, the 18S, the 5.8S. And then there's an inter internal transcribed spacer region, one internal transcribed spacer region, two between the uh, 18S and the 5.8S is ITS1, between the 5.8S and the 25S is ITS2. And those are the regions that we try to capture for the fungal um, sequences. Um, they're variable and they can be used uh, uh, usefully in fungal taxonomy and identification. They're more variable than the conserved uh, RNA genes themselves. So let's take a little bit of a minute to talk about our RNA targeted loci records and what's in our databases for those things. So we make curated targeted loci sequences for the bacterial 16S and the fungal ITS regions, as I've talked about. These are human curated. Um, they're based on qualified sequences from uh, the International Sequence Database Collaboration, which I'm going to call GenBank in this talk if I ever mention it again. These are submitted records. We choose these based on ones that are accurate, have the right characteristics. And we're trying to strive for reproducible data. The main point here is to make a clear association between the name, the specimen, and the sequence. It's become quite challenging, in fact, to make sure that GenBank is accurate in terms of the sequence identification. And so what we try to do here is to emphasize sequences that have links to the taxonomic type or verified material. And those are going to be cultures in the case of fungi and bacteria. 
And there's a little entree query switch that you can use. It's a filter that when you search the nucleotide database, you can use the sequence from type in the filter field, and that will restrict your search to those particular kinds of sequences. Now, those can be GenBank sequences as well as these reference sequences that we're talking about. And all these records are going to have links to the type strains in culture collections. Uh, we make these records in collaboration with outside taxonomy experts in the biomedical literature and those kinds of things. And here are some feature tables from two different records. The top one is from Lactobacillus delbrueckii, which is one of the bacteria that's used in yogurt cultures. And you can see right there, there's a link to the culture collection ATCC. Um, so you could click there. And if you wanted to order this culture, you could get it right from that entity or vendor. Uh, and the second one is uh, trichophyton rubrum, which is a, a, a skin uh, infectious agent that causes things like athlete's foot and things like that. And here you can see a link to the CBS um, database in the Netherlands, and you could order the culture from there. And then, of course, you can see on the feature table the various things that are there, the RNA genes plus the ITS regions. So we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So here's some recent statistics about what we have. Um, for the bacterial sequences, we're closing in on 20,000 records, and the vast majority of those are from type material. And you can see the distribution of the major groups of bacteria uh, that are in the 16S database right now. The 16S archaeal is a much smaller set of data, about 900 records. Most of them uh, are from type material. And if they're not from type material, we try to make them from some kind of verified material. Uh, the fungal records, there are about 4,500 of those. Again, most of those are from type material. A couple of comments. Uh, you'll find that there's often more than one sequence per species or strain. And that's because there may be different clones that represent maybe different members of the cassette where there's different genes. Um, we'll see an example of that with a bacterium. You'll see for the bacteria that there are also two kinds of RefSeq accession numbers, the NR representing the ribosomal RNA, and sometimes there's an NG. Whereas there's an NG RefSeq, that's because um, there are some bacterial and archaeal 16S regions that have introns in them. So we have both kinds of sequences for those. So how do you get access to this data? We do have a targeted loci page that's linked to our RefSeq page, and that link there will take you to it. When I show links in these webinars that NCBI in the angle brackets, that just represents our homepage URL, and that's the directories that are under that. Um, and so from this page, you can see the 16S project and link to all the sequences in the nucleotide database there. Here's the ITS project. And then here are some tools, in particular BLAST and MOLBLAST, which are two tools that I'm going to use today to search these data. Um, you can also look at the bioprojects themselves, um, and I've got the bioproject IDs here, so you could use this kind of a query uh, to get these from bioproject or indeed to get the records from the nucleotide database. Uh, again, that's the URL to our bioproject page there. If I want to get these records, they're all nucleotide records, and I can download them pretty easily from uh, the Entree nucleotide database or the new core database, uh, as we call it. So using any of these query terms here, I could get the set of sequences and download them and in whatever format I want, FASTA format if you want to do sequence analysis with them. Um, the largest set of these is the bacterial. It's 18,000 um, 16S RNA genes, and it's actually no trouble to download that through Entree. You can also get them from the FTP site. These are a part of the RefSeq release. And there is a BLAST database available that you can get from our BLAST um, page. And the FTP link there, of course, is the, the, the root directory of our FTP site and those are the directories under you need to go to. That's a fully formatted BLAST database. You can use that with some of the utilities that come with BLAST to generate these sequences in FASTA format from that if you want to. But as I said, at this point, it's no problem to download these directly from the Entree database. The main way you're going to access these data at our website, of course, is to use BLAST. Um, now, there is a dedicated um, 16S or a dedicated ribosomal RNA targeted loci BLAST page, but I think it's best to probably use our standard BLAST pages to do this. Um, so I can do this quite easily if I want to search the 16S right on the basic nucleotide BLAST page. I can also use those bioproject queries if I want to, to restrict to those from the NR database. And notice that I've circled here one of the checkboxes you can use to modify these. If you want only the sequences from type material, which as I pointed out, for these data sets is most of them, you can check that box there. 
There's another tool that I want to remind you about or tell you about if you've never heard of it before that's particularly suited for working with these kinds of sequences. And that tool is called MoleBlast, and it's linked to our BLAST homepage. That's the direct URL there where the BLAST in the ankle brackets is the URL of our BLAST homepage. This is a tool that's useful for identifying the sources of these 16S sequences. It's used in-house here at NCBI to sort of verify uh, GenBank submissions. It is a BLAST search followed by a global multiple alignment. It clusters your query sequences plus the most similar database sequences, and it's going to give you taxonomic units out of that. And you can also, of course, restrict to those sequences from type material as we did with BLAST. This is a perfect tool for searching against the 16S or the ITS databases. We did a webinar on this a little bit over a year ago. If you want to watch the recording of that, it's available on our YouTube channel, and that's a link to it um, right there in the bottom of this slide. <clears throat> so just to show you the MoleBlast interface, this is what it looks like. I can put um, a bunch of sequences in there. and In fact, this is a set of data I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit. And I can pick the database I want. So I can pick the 16S there because I know these are bacterial sequences. I notice that in the advanced parameters, I can check, check that I want to see only sequences from type material. And I could even restrict that a little further to say that those that have a binomial name, those that actually have a clear name that are not sort of tentative right now. Okay, so that's all the slides I want to show. So we're going to go over to some live examples. We're going to take a look at some of the sequences for a archaeon. Uh, Holoarchula narsmortui, which is from the Dead Sea. It's a halophilic archaeon, and it has divergent 16S's, and I just want to show you that. We'll take a fungal clone, and we'll try to identify it um, using the 16S database, and then we'll cluster some targeted sequences. Not the, I'm sorry, the, the fungal clone, of course, will be the ITS database, not the 16S. And then we'll use MoBlast to cluster um, targeted sequences. So I'll stop here for a minute just to see if there are any questions at this point before we go over to the <clears throat> web pages. So type some questions in there if you want to answer now. Um, we can also have some time at the end to, to answer some questions. Okay, nothing now. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to the live examples. And what I'm going to do here just to get out of this is I'll just click this link, which will open. That's the compressed URL that I had earlier. And so this is the directory that has these slides if you want them. It also has the demos that I'm about to do, and I'm actually going to cheat and leave that open because I need that. So at the top of this, by the way, are those three queries that we talked about, which are useful, so I put them in this file. And then the examples I'm going to do are spelled out for you here. So what I'm going to do is at first one, and I'll start off by going to the NCBI homepage here, and I'm going to go to the nucleotide database. And we're going to retrieve some 16S sequences, one for a particular species of archaea. I'm just going to go to the nucleotide database first here. And let's do a search. I can type it, but my typing is horrible. So what I'll do is just copy and paste this thing to save some time. And so that's the bio project for the 16S sequences. This is a scientific name for an archaeon, a Holoarchula maris mortui. And so I now have six of these records. Notice that they're for different strains. And I'll pick the ones that have the ATCC number on them. So there are two from each one of these three different strains. So I've got two of them. And let's go ahead and analyze these by running BLAST. So this link here is on all of our sequence records, and you can get it for an, you know, a combination of sequence records like this. So I'll go ahead and throw these over here into the BLAST search page. And so now I'm going to have two queries. And what I want to do is we're going to align these to the genome. We have a genomic sequence for this particular strain of this organism. So the RefSeq version of that is going to be in our RefSeq genomic database here. I have to watch myself because it remembers what I've done before. So I'm going to take that stuff off because I don't want that. Um, and so I'm going to add the organism name here. And I can just 
It doesn't really matter in this case because we're only going to have one in here, but I can go ahead and pick the particular genome that I want right here. You see it does match once I learn how to type. And then we can go ahead and run that. Now this shouldn't be too bad because we did restrict it, but the RefSeq genomic database is large, so if time gets tight, I can go ahead and retrieve those results myself. And I have the RID here in the blast in the handout here, so I'll go ahead and get those. By the way, these RIDs should be valid for a little while anyway. Well, it looks like it came in, so that's fine. So notice I, I searched with two sequences and my results are therefore separate. So it's this paginated output, which you probably are familiar with with BLAST. So this is an interesting phenomenon. This particular archaeon has two chromosomes. And so there's actually copies of the 16S on both of them. And in fact, on chromosome one, there are two copies. So this is one of them. You can see the, per the very good match here, which is a perfect match. And here's the second one where the match is not so perfect. And that's why, as I was trying to point out in this example, we've made two records for this particular organism because there are two distinct and quite divergent 16S genes. One way to look at this, which I think is fairly useful to do, is to go to the graphics view here. One advantage of this is it's loaded the entire BLAST results so we can see the hits from both of our sequences by clicking here. So I'm going to click on graphics. And you can see that they're, you can, they're kind of hard to see because we're kind of zoomed out, but there's a hit over here and there's one over here. And so these are the two different ribosomal RNA genes. I can just sort of zoom in, just look at those if I want to. There's the 16S gene. And here you can see the two different query sequences. One aligns perfectly, one has a bunch of mismatches. And if you want to yourself, you can go back and retrieve these. Look at the other one, and you'll see that, that, doesn't, that that's the opposite. They flipped. It's perfect on one of them and not perfect on the other one. Okay, so that's one example. Let's do the second example, which is to identify a fungal clone. So what I'm going to do is retrieve a particular sequence. I'll go ahead and clean up my tabs here. Actually, it might be easier to save us a little bit of time. I'll just go straight to BLAST because I can use the accession number to do this. This is an uncultured fungal sequence from a population um, set that's a, an environmental study. I'll go ahead and go to the BLAST page here. And I can get my accession number here, which is the uncultured fungal clone. This is a typo, which I fixed. This is the actual accession number here. I did not type that very well. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste this into Nucleotide Blast. Now we can run this against NR if we want to. That would be the default when you come here. One thing that's kind of useful to do sometimes is to reset the page. We can search the Nucleotide Collection. If we want to, we can select sequences from type material. You can run this yourself without doing that, and what you'll find is you get a lot of hits to uncultured clones of fungi. I can check this box here if I want to, and it'll give me a much cleaner set of search results. And the fungal ITS sequences are in, the, uh, in our database, and so we can get them quite easily by doing this particular search and hit them. Okay, I got them before I could get the URL together for you. So notice that I have an NR sequence here. This is one of our RefSeq ITS regions. This is a sequence from GenBank. Um, but these are all going to be associated with type material. And so I have an, un an uncultured fungus, and my best hit is the penicillium subrubescens. You can take a look at that down here. You might like to know whether how different that is. 
from the clone that I did. So you can use the formatting options here to change this to pairwise with dots for identities, which is a useful view, in particular if you're trying to uh, identify something. And so we can see that there is a single mismatch, uh, and this is probably the right species. And if I wanted to take a look at this record, which I think is a useful thing to do here, I can go back and take a look at it in the nucleotide database. You can see it has information about the fact that this is um, the type material for this particular species, where it was collected from, and there's a link to the database in the Netherlands where I could order that particular clone. And you can see what's on here is ITS1, the 5.8S ribosomal RNA, and the 20 and part of the 28S ribosomal RNA. So it's got both of these internal transcribed spacer regions, which are the more variable parts of this, which are aids in species identification. If you want to see that in some kind of a, a more easy to understand way of the feature table, you can always click on this graphics link to show you that, which we've already done once today. And here's um, ITS1, 28S, ITS1 here, 5.8S here, ITS2, and the 28S here. Okay, last example, um, we're going to get a set of sequences from our POPSET database. These are from a wastewater treatment plant, and I've used this before with MoBlast, um, but it's a useful example just to show you how that works. And this will be a search against the 16S sequences. So let me go ahead and get those sequences for you. And basically, I'm just going to use a link to retrieve these from POPSET, which is one of our entry databases. And I don't need to do anything because I've got the URL. What I'd like to have are just these nucleotide sequences so I can work with them in a BLAST search, in particular a mole BLAST search. I'm just going to follow the link to nucleotide. And there are 437 of those. I could potentially try to cluster all of them with mole blast. That's rather expensive and time consuming. So just um, we'll just use a subset of them just to show you how this works. One way to do this is to get the accession list. That's just going to give me the first 20. I can take the first 10 of these if I want to, or I can try all 20 of them. I can get the I have mole blast already saved for this. This could MobileBlast takes a few minutes to run, longer than we really have for a webinar. But I'm just going to copy those to the clipboard. Uh, I'm going to go over here. Go to the, um, sorry, go to the NCBI homepage. Go to Blast. And the MobileBlast page is linked to our new Blast page. Um, probably you've seen the new Blast homepage. It's down here in the lower right-hand corner. So I now have these 20 accession numbers here of these basically uncultured bacterial clones from this wastewater treatment plant. And I'll search that against the 16S ribosomal sequences. This is the BLAST database, and this contains both the bacterial and the archaeal projects. Notice that I could also do the same thing with the fungi. And in that um, document on the FTP site, there's a set of fungal sequences, the same one that I got that clone from earlier. You can play around with uh, trying to cluster those if you want to. Now, what I'd like to do is go down here to the advanced parameters because that's where I can do things like make sure that I'm only looking at sequences from type, which is a good thing to be able to do. I can adjust other parameters of the mole blast search down here. And then I can go ahead and run that. This takes a few minutes to run. So what I'm going to do instead of doing that I ran some mole blast searches earlier today. Uh, one of them did not work, so don't worry about that one. But I can go ahead and retrieve the results so you can see what that looks like. So this is our new 
tree viewer, which is a, a little bit more deluxe than anything we've had for this purposes before. Let me go ahead and make that maximize. Um, but there's a lot of uh, leaves here. One thing you can do is if you click on this uh, optimal zoom button here, then lets you see things a little bit more clearly. And so now we have all these uncultured bacterial clones, but you can see that they've now been classified for me at least to um, high level bacterial groups here. So you can see that I can at least figure out you know, whether they're in beta proteobacteria um, or other things like that, or other groups that I recognize, like cyanobacteria. Some of them I might even feel like I've got to the level of the genus, like this one, Exiguobacterium. There's a little bit of a distance here. I can display that alignment if I want to just by clicking this link here. That will open that in a new tab, and I can evaluate what I think about the relationship among those sequences. So notice that it's got one of my query sequences here, and it's got these sequences here. Now this is actually the title of the record. If you wanted to, if you were really trying to be good about checking the taxonomic name, you could use that as a link on your node there. If I do that, it's going to redraw my tree and I have to start over again, so I'm not going to do that. Just keep in mind, if you're really trying to identify something, select this as the label for your leaf node. So let's just go ahead and show that alignment there. And it got me with the pop-up blocker. There it is. So this is the alignment, and you can see my query sequence embedded in those um, 16S sequences. You can actually change this to dots for identities like we did previously to see where the differences are. So it agrees with several of these sequences at this point where it's different. Uh, and then there's some changes towards the end of the sequence um, that may or may not be important. You'd have to evaluate that. And from here, you could download this alignment if you want to, or you could do the entire thing to download. OK, so I think that's all I wanted to show you for today. Just to remind you that um, if you need help with any of this stuff, you can go to our Learn page, which has links to the webinars and courses page where you can find the materials for this. We have a set of fact sheets that are very helpful. Check on our YouTube channel for um, this video and other recordings of webinars and other helpful videos. If you have any questions about this webinar, um, the content of it, write to info or write to me, Cooper, at NCBI or Peter Cooper at NIH.gov. If you have questions about the webinar program or technicalities about the webinar itself, you can write to webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And I'll leave the webinar open for a few minutes for questions. Um, so we'll, we'll stay online for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, we're not hearing from anybody right now, but please feel free to write if you have any questions. I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar for now, and we'll talk to you soon.